brokenhearted and downtrodden, and we who are filled to overflowing with the joy that is the Lord's can come together in Christian fellowship. Thank you for the story of one of our elders, a story that has roots in a sister church in a sister city and has put down roots here in Georgetown. We hear so many familiar echoes of the way that your love and the lives of others have shaped ours and have joined us together. Thank you for that ongoing work that continues even now in this place with the children who are upstairs, with all who will come through the ministries of this church today at 9 and 10 and 11 and 6. Thank you, O oh Lord, for those from this congregation who are on mission today, those who are preparing to travel to Appalachia later in the week, those who are preparing to travel to Guatemala. Lord, we see so many places in Scripture where you are at work, and yet your people fail to see. Forgive our blindness. And help us to stand on the shoulders and walk in the footsteps of our elders. So that we, like they, may see where you are at work in our world. And in our church. And may join you there. In Jesus' name. I want to ask you to join with me in, in looking again to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 19. Our passage today really gets a running start at Luke 19. It, it, it begins really at the end of Luke chapter 18, so I will ask you to join me there in, in a moment. We continue today in a sermon series from the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. We started studying Luke's Gospel back right after Thanksgiving, and we now find ourselves walking with Jesus. He has set his face for Jerusalem. He is heading for the cross. And we'll continue this sermon series well into the summer months as we, as we see how uh, the work of the Holy Spirit spread the good news of Jesus all throughout the ancient Roman world. Jesus today is nearing the end of his physical journey. He is moving toward Jerusalem. And he finds himself arriving at the city of Jericho. Would you join me in reading? I'll start at Luke chapter 18 at verse 35. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he shouted even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, praised God. Continuing in Luke chapter 19 at verse 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble. And said, 
he's gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I'll give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Jesus is almost to Jerusalem. All that's left is to enter the city of Jericho, travel through it, turn right to the west, and head up into the mountains. Jericho sits about 200 feet below sea level. Jerusalem sits about 800 feet above sea level. Up, up, up into the mountains is all that's left of this journey. And yet there's so much more of Jesus' ministry to be accomplished. He encounters some folks with a familiar situation to something that that I struggle with, and perhaps you do as well. The question I'd like for you to entertain with me this morning is this one. Have you ever been caught up in destructive behavior? Have you ever been caught up with what these two men at the end of chapter 18 and the beginning of chapter 19 are struggling with? Spiritual blindness. I'm reminded of a sister story to this one in John's Gospel, John chapter 9, where the disciples ask a question about a man who is suffering with with blindness, and they say, who sinned, this man or his mama and his daddy? And, and, And hilarity ensues as Jesus heals the man, and then the question just continues to multiply over and over and over again, who sinned? And by whose authority has this healing taken place until finally the blind man is incredulous. I don't know who he is, but I know this, he says, a blind man being, that is to say my entire life, my identity has been tied up in my blindness, a blind man being, now I see. Are you so blind that you cannot see where the Lord is plainly at work? Have you, like me, ever gotten all caught up in destructive behavior? Look with me at chapter 18, verse 43. Luke tells us uh, the people who saw the healing, saw sight restored, celebrated. All the people praised God. And then the Jesus entourage and the Jesus movement moves from the outskirts of Jericho into the city, getting ready to travel together up to Jerusalem. And at verse 7, now that Jesus is is, is wanting, well, he invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. He's He's from northern Galilee. He's not from the south, right? You don't just invite yourself over. And the people... Again, Luke tells us, all, all who saw it began to grumble. In Jesus' case, in chapter 18, verse 43, the crowd approved of a blind man getting his sight, but in chapter 19, verse 7, the crowd disapproves of Jesus' interest in Zacchaeus and people like him. Just to be clear, these are not the religious snobs, the religious elites, the folks who have the most to lose from the Jesus movement, the people we've been studying the last few weeks. These are the people at the heart of the Jesus movement. And they celebrate that a blind man receives his sight out on the edge of town, but to come in and see Jesus dealing with and having openness to a crook who has defrauded all of them is just too much for the Jesus movement to bear. And all the same people who celebrated that a blind man had received sight are now grumbling that Jesus would have compassion for someone they would exclude. 
see the crowd is starting to think like a crowd. And not that early crowd who would come uh, back in the early chapters of, uh, of Luke's gospel and press in on Jesus and demand from him healing or whatever it was that they requested. These are the people who've been traveling with him for some time. There is powerful, heart-breaking foreshadowing in this story. Foreshadowing of the support of the crowd that will stand and cheer and sing for Jesus next week on Palm Sunday. And will reject him the following Thursday. The mob is starting to think like a mob. If you've never heard that phrase, you're familiar with the concept. You've seen it on the evening news with violence toward women at various political rallies with various candidates. You've seen it in the filthiness that's been reported from National Football League ball games hosted by the New York Jets. A female who dares to go through the wrong concourse at the wrong uh, break between quarters will be accosted by filth. You've seen it and heard about it in stories from the French Revolution and other historic moments. But have you, like these and like I, been swept up, caught up in destructive behaviors? Let's talk about how to get unstuck from moments and behaviors such as these. First suggestion of five of how to get unstuck from destructive behaviors. First of all, beware absolute words. Have you had this argument? You always, I always... You never, I never. Have you had this argument? I've had it a few times, you can tell. These words that Luke uses in chapter 18, verse 43, and chapter 19, verse 7, all the people, all the crowd, words like always and never and none are seldom accurate and even more seldom helpful. Other examples include, you always forget to, you never help around the house, none of my co-workers do any work before 11 a.m. on a Monday, you used up all the glue on purpose. These are words that mostly alienate. They seldom build up possibility. Avoid them as much as possible. I wouldn't say always avoid them. I wouldn't say never use them, but for the most part, avoid those absolute words. Secondly, another beware. If Jesus made woe statements, I'll give a couple of bewares today. Beware digital communication, right? Now, we know this. You have crafted a perfectly worded six-page rant, I mean email. Beware the temptation to send it. The old rule, it's, my goodness, 25 or 30 years old now is hit save, not send. Hit save, go home, get some exercise, Breathe deeply, eat a healthy dinner, go to bed early, come back the next day, read it over again, and 99 times out of 100, you'll scratch your head and wonder, why was I so upset? Why, why, why did I even write this? Delete. Oh, but that one time out of 100 that you hit send instead of save, it's almost a guarantee you'll regret it. Something similar is true of of social media, seldom, if ever, does, does the feel-good moment go beyond that, that hitting of send. 
the post that seems to rebut exactly what has been tweeted or posted brings ridicule and only invites more vitriol. Same rule. Log off, close it down, go home, take a walk, self-imposed 24-hour ban, come back. And if, and if a response still is needed, and, and there have been times when I have said to somebody, I, I really hope you'll take that post down. Send the private option. The, the public confrontation almost never accomplishes what you hope it will. So beware those absolute words, always, never, all, none. And secondly, beware digital communication in its various forms. But third, show actions before speaking words. Show actions before speaking words. Have you noticed the order that Zacchaeus followed? Have you noticed all of the effort that goes into his transformation before he ever says a single word? All the action he takes in getting out ahead of Jesus, trying once to see him failing before the crowd, or running ahead to get on beyond the crowd, climbing up a tree, listening to Jesus, responding to Jesus' invitation by coming down, rushing on ahead at home and, and, and tidying things up and, and making arrange, arrangements for a, a meal so that Jesus and Jesus' entourage can arrive in his home. All of these things happen before Zacchaeus utters a word. All of these things take place before he responds verbally to the presence of Jesus in his, in his life. Take action before speaking words. This applies in the workplace. It applies in situations where there are, are, are factions in, in the neighborhood or with the employer. Cross on over, make overtures uh, before making any grand pronouncements uh, about unification. It applies in the church. Before, before criticizing or raising questions about a ministry area, volunteer there. Right? Volunteer there. Walk around in it for a minute before being so verbal. Fourth, take a stand. In the end, that's what Zacchaeus does, even though it's not clear that there's anyone else there to stand with him. Take a stand. Verse 8, after making all of this effort to lay the foundation, he makes a verbal declaration to the Lord. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I'll give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll pay back four times as much. He takes responsibility for his past. He takes responsibility for the fact that there's a, a human component to his actions. There are people who have been wronged. There have been individuals who have suffered because of his actions, because of his decisions. He takes a stand and acknowledges all the wrong that he has done has impacted other people and begins to apply the kingdom life to his present and to his future. It's an example of godly generosity. Verse 6, he receives Jesus and the entourage into his home. That must have been a, an expensive arrangement. In, in verse 8, he pledges half of his possessions to the poor. He, he promises to give back four times over to others that he has wronged. Scholars have sometimes questioned whether Zacchaeus' own household finances could possibly have covered this pledge. And it seems that the way that he's uh, planning to accomplish this is that it, it, it's covered in his grammar. It's covered in the, uh, the verb uh, tenses that he uses here. Uh, maybe a, a more complete translation of verse 8 would be something like, 
I am resolved now that I will continue into the future to repay this debt and give half of my expenses, half of my income to the poor. In other words, he's declaring that he will live by the law of Moses, which says in the book of Exodus that if you're a thief and you want to square things, you need to pay back fourfold. And he wants to live in kingdom fellowship with his neighbor. These words are a good start. They build on the foundation of action that he's made. But this is a pledge that will require him to continue to pay on it into the future. He will have to adjust his behaviors in order to give these folks back and settle the debt weeks, months, perhaps years even down the road takes a stand. And lastly, pay it forward. Pay it forward. Because there's someone close by who is stuck in the mire of destructive behaviors in worse ways than you or I can ever imagine. And they desperately need someone who's out of the muck to give them a hand of assistance and words of encouragement. There's a legendary figure in the church uh, of Russia. A legendary figure when that church was largely underground and a legendary figure that exists today. His name was Vasily Rakov, lived in the 19th century. I say a legendary figure, I've, I've tried to figure out if there's a corresponding figure in American folklore, and all I could come up with is he's kind of a cross between Paul Bunyan and Martin Luther King Jr. Right? We know a little bit about him, but there's a lot of legendary talk that doesn't quite have the historic ring to it. It's more legend than fact. One reason that his biography is so hard to nail down is because he lived much of his adult life in and out of prison. And it's just kind of hard to, to get a biography for folks who live their lives in a, in a dungeon in, in Russia. By the way, this was also a time when many prisons were the retrofitted basements of Christian monasteries that had sold out for political gain. What was his crime? Well, he had a habit through his, through his actions and his words, a habit of making local magistrates and priests uncomfortable by talking about Jesus all the time and through his radical acts of service. But what I'd like to focus on today was Vasily Rakov's sense of calling. Because the legends abound about his life, but it was his sense of calling that carried him and drove him forward. His sense of calling can be traced back to three conversations, three relationships that took place in his formative years between the days that he was a, a, a late teenager and a, a young or emerging adult. The first conversation, the first relationship took place took place with one of his father's business associates, someone who was in their home on a regular basis in Vasily's teenage years, someone who was in his life through his father's business dealings. They had many opportunities for conversation. There was a great deal of mutual respect, and it became clear that this business associate was a man of Christian faith. And at some point, he spoke into and over Vasily's life with these words. He said, I set a seal... On your two hands, they shall be a blessing to everyone. The second relationship was a few years later with a, a master to whom Vasily was apprenticed. It was in those days when at some point a, a young person would leave a home and enter into apprenticeship for a few years with someone in order to learn a trade before setting out on their own uh, to practice that trade. This master, too, was a Christian business person. And after a couple of years of apprenticeship, he wanted to present to Vasily 
his own copy of the scriptures. Our 21st century American minds cannot begin to imagine what a controversial and countercultural gift that was 150 years ago in Russia and throughout much of Christian history. In fact, uh, one, one historian or legend teller says that Vasily's father disapproved of this because of his orthodoxy. That is to say, once he received this copy of the scripture, he had to read it in secret so that he would not run afoul of the local, local magistrates or be disowned by his father. But the master presented the, the private copy of the scripture to his apprentice with these words. I set a seal on your eyes so that you will see nothing in this holy book but Jesus' power and great love. And the legend would be that Vasily spent hours in the Word every day, regardless of where he was. The third relationship was a few years later after Vasily had finished his apprenticeship and had started running a, a factory in a village nearby. There was a woman there who had who had decided to, to, to allow her life to lift the lives of everyone who was employed in that factory. It was a miserable existence, and yet the, the lower village, the half of town that was the working class uh, that lived in such squalor and suffering, uh, was defined by such, a, by such a joy and a lightness of mood because of this one woman who had decided to invest her life there. Vasily was so impressed by her that he sought out a, a mentorship of sorts. And finally, she spoke this blessing over his life as well. She said, I set a seal on your heart. Jesus alone shall rule here. Away with all sadness and complaining. Come, Spirit of God, dwell here within this man and grow until he is filled with with your purifying love. These relationships and their words of blessing, of seal, of call, so formed and transformed Vasily Rakov's life that he became legendary for his Christian commitment, his simple piety. This too is what Zacchaeus, or what Jesus did for Zacchaeus. By simply looking around and looking up and speaking words of inclusion and invitation to Zacchaeus. Come down. Come to where I am. So that I may come to where you are. I'm coming to your house today. Jesus transformed Zacchaeus' entire reality with those simple words. So simple and yet so life-giving that you and I can do this as well. We've talked about the children in our, in our church today. Mary Beth has talked about college students in our church today. We're going into small group Bible study in just a moment with our peers, with our elders. There is someone in your sphere of influence who desperately needs to have someone speak a word of seal, a word of inclusion, a word of invitation into and over his or her life. A word of recognition. A word that says, you too can find peace and direction within the kingdom life of Jesus Christ. And some of us, as we make our way out of destructive behaviors and destructive patterns, can look around, and because of our past, we'll be able to recognize that familiar look upon the faces, that familiar struggle upon the lives of those who too need to go with us out of lives of destructive patterns and behaviors. Speak a word. Pay it forward. Welcome them into the life of Christ, just as Jesus welcomed Zacchaeus into his. We've spoken of transformation in many ways today. The most important way that your life could possibly be transformed 
would be to give it to Jesus, to follow him, to abide in the one who has given us life and wants to give it to us in the full. If you're ready today to follow Jesus, we would encourage you to accept him as Savior and as Lord. And if that's the decision that you want to make today, then won't you come forward and share that with us. We're going to sing a song now, a, a song of response. For some of us, it will be an opportunity to simply lift our voices in praise. But for you, if you're ready for life transformation, if you're ready to be forgiven and transformed into the new creation that Christ wants you to be, then won't you come and make that decision known. Others of you may recognize that, that you've been living in isolation and you're ready to find fellowship with these sisters and brothers in Christ. If you're ready to be a member of Georgetown Baptist Church, we would love to welcome you and receive you. Others may recognize that there are destructive behaviors and you need to follow these five steps and others toward the life that Jesus intends for you. You need to pray a prayer of forgiveness today. You need to pray a prayer of thanksgiving that the Lord is taking control of your life once again. However it is that you need to respond, we stand and we sing in hopes that you'll come.